In a video I made a few months ago, I 3D scanned my old reliable axe, and I made these three shots in Unreal Engine 5. Now, a lot of you asked me to make a video about how these shots were made, so here it is. I'll show you my workflow and process from start to finish, from the 3D scanning part, to mesh cleanup and texturing, to fleshing out the environment in Unreal Engine 5, lighting, rendering, and color grading, as always. Now, full disclosure, this video is sponsored by Capturing Reality, and I use Reality Capture to scan this axe. I have many tutorials on 3D scanning, but this time around, the process was a little bit different. Reason being, the axe itself has many different material types. A well-aged wooden shaft, high carbon steel, a leather sheet with brass rivets. So I wanted to make a high quality asset that rendered cleanly in Unreal Engine because I knew this was going to be a close-up shot. And when you're doing a hero shot like this, the 3D models need to hold up to a whole lot more scrutiny. So, step one, scanning the axe itself with the help of photogrammetry. To make my life a whole lot easier, to not have to you know, move the camera around so much, I mounted the axe on the ceiling with a rotatable arm. That way the camera can stay fixed on a tripod and all I need to do is spin the axe at five degree increments and taking photos from every angle. The chonker camera rig you see here is a cross polarized setup. The purpose of this flash and filter is to cut out all reflections on an object, giving you a very matte look, which is ideal for photogrammetry because you need consistency between photos. And when you have reflections, those reflections shift and change based on view angles, right? Which is no bueno. Once a loop was done, I lowered the camera and shot another loop until all angles of the act were shot. With the photos taken, I hopped into Reality Capture, aligned the cameras, as you'll see here, we get a point cloud preview of what the act will look like, and generated a 3D model based on those photos. Now I did run into one issue, and that's the shininess of the edge of the blade itself. Looking closely here, even with a cross polarized setup, it's really hard to remove reflections on some near chrome-like metal. And on top of that, there is just not much in the way of feature point. It's too smooth, too polished, too mirror-like. You'll see that the result is not great. That polished metal means the scan in this area will not turn out well unless I use this stuff. A sub scanning spray, which is kind of magical. What it does is it covers a surface with texture, allowing you to scan your object and get better, cleaner results. But the best part is it just fades away over time on its own. There's no need to clean it off. It, it kind of blows my mind. So that allowed me to get a much cleaner scan to work with. Now it's still not perfect. I brought it into ZBrush for polishing and retopology. For those unaware, retopology is the process of cleaning up your mesh, going from this kind of wireframe to this to get a cleaner topology. Again, you can see that entire workflow in this video right here, link below so I don't bore you with the details. Now, I actually repeated this whole process twice, one version with the leather sheets and one without. Then using a Boolean operation in ZBrush, I was able to get a proper separate piece of geometry for the sheet itself, giving me clean overhangs and a slightly more realistic look. It's really nice to have granular control over separate pieces of geo like that. Now, bringing the polished model back into Reality Capture, then I generated the textures from the photos taken, which we get for free as part of the photogrammetry process. That provides a good foundation to work from, but it's really only the base color that we get, the albedo map. I needed to bring this texture into Substance Painter because we need to ensure proper physically based material definition between the various types of surfaces, wood, steel, leather, and brass. Like I said, the base color and normal map texture we get out of Reality Capture is fantastic. Working in Painter, however, just allows us to push this even further. With our model exported, our texture exported out of Substance Painter, now's the time to jump into Unreal Engine 5. With Unreal Open, the first thing I love to do is to set up a basic daylight system using the environment light mixer. And in just a few clicks, we've got a fully dynamic sky and clouds, totally free, which helps us see what we're doing. I like doing it because I don't like working in a black void. So having a decent lighting setup to work with is a good starting point. Now, after that, 
the first step in creating any shot is establishing the composition, the framing, setting up the camera early on. Really, this should be roughly one of the first things you do. Place your subject in the frame, place a camera, and get that composition nailed down before you start spending any time fleshing out your scene. You want to start working on only the things the camera will see. There's no point in spending hours making a beautiful level only to realize that most of your hard work isn't even going to be in the frame. You get the point. Then I just move my directional light in the rough direction I want it to come from to establish the initial lighting pass. But because my end goal here is to render a top quality, no exceptions kind of image, I went with Unreal's Path Tracer, which is simply put, a no BS brute force approach to rendering. The path tracer sacrifices all performance and throws it out the window for the sake of maximum quality. And that's what I wanted for the shot. Now, when I'm working and moving assets around, I do turn the path tracer off, but when I'm testing things out and getting a feel for the lighting, that is when I switch it on. I've made a tutorial on the path tracer here, which was in UE4, but I'll be making an updated one soon, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. When it comes to detailing a level, this is going to sound silly, but a lot of it boils down to opening up the Quixel Bridge, finding the assets you need, and adding them to your project. I like to spend a good half hour or so building a good library before doing anything. And from there, kit bash away. My philosophy is to start with the big shapes, like establishing the ground, larger rocks and trees, plants. There's no need to dive into the details yet. That comes later. Don't get bogged down into the details too early. Now, because I'm using the path tracer, I can't make use of Nanite, which is Unreal's way of handling literal billions of polygons on screen at once. Because Nanite isn't quite real geometry, so to speak. It's what we call virtualized geometry, and that is not supported by the path tracer, at least not now. So as crazy as it seems when I'm using Unreal Engine 5, I needed to go disable Nanite on the objects, on the models I wanted to use in the shot. Just be careful because that can put a lot of strain on your graphics card. Now with this wide open patch of ground, it's still really not feeling like a forest, right? From there, it's just a matter of adding relatively larger scale foliage, bushes, shadows cast by larger trees to make it feel like a forest floor. Because this is pretty close up, there is no need to bring in actual large trees. I just scaled up these bushes here so they cast shadows on the ax area. All we need are some of those busy pattern shadows, a kind of filtered light look, right? From there, it is a process of experimentation, moving the sunlight around, trying to find an angle that looks nice and adjusting the tree shadow casters accordingly. It's definitely a bit of trial and error here. Now this next part is kind of all part of the magic sauce. So far, you might think I'm really oversimplifying things, but this whole process is the easy part. Find reference, go outside, pay attention to detail. Notice the little things. Notice how the grass grows between rocks. Notice the difference in the frequency of detail, small, high frequency details and larger, lower frequency details. Make sure your rocks are not all the same scale. You want variation, but variation in a way that makes sense. I see students of mine painting rocks everywhere with the foliage tool. They go nuts with scale variation, but it's never going to look good this way because the randomness is too even, too consistent. Again, look at reference and notice patterns and how pebbles and sand and mud blend together. It's really going to open your eyes as to how things look and feel natural. Reference is key. Do not try to make things from memory. Your brain will lie to you and your art will suffer as a result. Let me explain to you why I'm talking about this. Take this large, rocky, pebbly Megascans model, for example. You don't need to use this at a one-to-one -one scale. A little trick or a hack or call it whatever you want that I like to use all the time is to take this bad boy and scale it way down and duplicate it across the ground like this then rotate it to break up the repeating tiling pattern and boom, we have a sand like ground. No landscape mesh, no complex blending material, no displacement. Thanks to the path tracer, you just know it's going to look good. That is the kind of detail that is 
much trickier to nail down with Lumen and Nanite because Nanite doesn't really render polygons that are smaller than a pixel. And you miss out on that sub pixel detail. That is why I often opt for path tracing. Take this comparison of the exact same scene, one rendered with the path tracer and another with Lumen and Nanite, the difference in shadow and global illumination detail is day and night. No pun intended. Hey, so Future Will here. I just want to take a moment to say that I am not hating on Lumen here. This comparison is a testament to how good Lumen has become. But as we can see, path tracing is king when it comes to max quality. Lastly, it's all about the attention to detail. The final touches, adding leaves and twigs and very small details that make a complete world of difference when it comes to that last little 5%. This is the part that people often overlook or just don't push hard enough or just don't have the eye to notice these things. Here's a quick before and after. It's a subtle change, but it really ties the whole piece together. You can also use the details to hide imperfections. It's kind of a win-win. With that done, before rendering, I decided to have a little bit of fun just to try some different times of day, I went for an overcast feel and a nighttime shot. Really, this is purely creative work. Having fun with the various lighting tools in Unreal, I recommend watching my dedicated lighting tutorial right here to learn the basics, as there are a hundred ways to light a shot, and all of them are valid. You just need to know what you're going for and the tools available to you. For the overcast day, I simply use a skylight with an HDRI found on HDRI Haven, and for the nighttime shot, it's really just a bluish directional light and I added a point light to simulate campfire. With our shots done now, we move on to the rendering and color grading phase. So I'm going to be rendering these out at max quality using the movie render queue. Here we can determine the resolution we want, the console variables we want, and the anti-aliasing or sampling settings. In the post-process volume under the path tracing tab, I'm going to disable the denoiser because I will denoise myself in DaVinci Resolve but we're gonna get into that real soon. In the movie render queue, be sure to delete the deferred rendering tab and add the path tracing tab instead because we want the path tracer. Always render in 16-bit EXR to get the highest bit depth, which gives us flexibility in post. In color output, be sure to disable the tone curve. And under anti-aliasing, override anti-aliasing should be checked. Set AA method to none. And with the path tracer, 16 by 16 is a good starting point. Troubleshooting path trace renders is really easy. If your shots are noisy, you need more samples. That's all there is to it. In the output tab is where I determine my desired resolution. And in this case, I want 4K. When you're ready, hit that render local button and wait. The path tracer is way slower than a deferred renderer. So go make a sandwich or something and come back later. Six hours later. Now. I've talked about this in many videos. I even have a whole video dedicated to color grading in DaVinci Resolve, but really this part of the process is where you really make your renders shine. Color grading is entirely subjective. What one person might like, another person won't. There isn't a good or bad way to grade. It's all about the taste and getting the look you want. I don't want to spend too much time on the nitty gritty here because again, I've made two whole videos on color grading in Resolve already. The one thing I do want to show you, however, is denoising in Resolve, because the path tracer by nature is going to be substantially grainier than when you use the deferred rendering. In the free version of Resolve, select your imported clip and go to the Fusion page. Press Shift Space and add the Noise Reduction tool. From there, your denoise settings will be on the right. If you own the $300 studio version of Resolve, you can add the noise reduction in the color page, which is by far my preferred way of working. I generally don't really enjoy using Fusion. So here's a quick before and after of each of the three final renders I did. You may or may not like the direction I took and that's okay. But that being said, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope I was able to shed a little bit more light on my rendering workflow. Thanks so much for watching and as always, Happy rendering.